Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. We'll get started in just a few minutes. We're just going to give everyone a couple more minutes to jump on and we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome to everybody on both Zoom and Facebook Live. My name is Rachel Guillory with the National Audubon Society. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn a bit about birds that nest on the Gulf Coast. First, I want to say uh, that we hope that you and your loved ones are well and doing what you can to stay safe and healthy during the coronavirus pandemic. I know that there's a lot of bad news. A lot of our fun spring events are canceled, but the one thing that's not canceled is of course spring. And that brings nesting season for a lot of our beach nesting birds on the Gulf Coast. And even though we can't be out on our beaches right now to see these birds because of the shutdowns, we can still learn about them and the challenges that they face and what we can do to help protect them. Um, Speaking of challenges, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that this coming Monday, April 20th, makes 10 years, as you can see on the slide here, since the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded. Uh, it was, of course, a terrible tragedy that took human lives as well as birds, wildlife, um, and our beaches got oiled. But a lot has changed in the last 10 years. BP paid an unprecedented $20 billion settlement for its role in the disaster, and that money is finally starting to make a difference for birds and people on the Gulf Coast. So we'll try to cover all of that today. First, uh, here are our speakers. They're representatives from each of our Gulf State offices, um, coastal programs. So first we have Alexis Baldera from Audubon, Texas. Katie Barnes from Audubon, Louisiana, Melinda Averhart from Audubon, Mississippi, and Holly Short from Audubon, Florida. We'd also like to give a shout out to all of our Audubon Gulf Coast chapters who have helped us establish our Coastal Bird Stewardship Program, especially Alabama Audubon. They're a really important partner there in the state of Alabama to help us make sure that, that we reach the entire Gulf Coast. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alexis. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> As Rachel said, my name is Alexis Baldera and I am our Coastal Program Manager here in Texas. So today I'm gonna be starting the webinar with a little bit of history. So sharing a success story about what stewardship can look like in Texas and then going back a little bit to talk about the history of National Audubon Society to kind of talk about how the stewardship work is, is founded and how it started. So next slide, please. So our history has always been about protecting birds. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, birds were declining at an alarming rate. And this was mostly because of hunting. And so birds were being hunted for their feathers, for their meat, to make oil, and also their eggs were being collected, both as food and just as something to collect because they're beautiful. <laughs> and so 
the birds on this screen are some of the birds that suffered from that hunting. Um, and that's for a few reasons. You can see that they have beautiful feathers. The snowy egret, the roseate spoonbill, and the great egret all have beautiful feathers. So they were a likely target if you're looking for a feather for your hat or as an accessory, looking to sell a feather. And the second reason is that they're all colonial nesting birds. Um, so the colonial nesters get together in large groups to nest every year. They breed and nest a lot of times in the same spot. So they're a very easy target if you're looking to go hunt these birds. Next slide, please. So people noticed this decline in birds and they were really concerned and wanted to find ways to stop that decline. So they started getting together and forming boycotts and holding tea parties to educate people. And there was also a movement to shift from wearing feathers to wearing ribbons um, instead of feathers. And that really changed the trend. And to show kind of the quantity of impact that this was having on the birds, the American Ornithologist Union estimated that in 1886, 5 million birds were being killed every year for the feather trade. So two women, one named Harriet Hemingway shown here, and one named Minna Halls really organized this effort to shift from wearing feathers to wearing ribbons and got 900 women to do that. And local Audubon chapters started forming around the country. Our first Audubon chapter was in Galveston in Texas and that started in 1899. And then in 1905, those small chapters rolled up to become what is the National Audubon Society today. So next slide, please. <clears throat> um, after forming as a National Audubon Society, our organization became very vocal in the passage of the Migratory Birds Treaty Act, and this started to offer some regulatory protection for these bird populations. And in 1921, the state of Texas hired Audubon's first coastal warden, and this person was charged with protecting Green Island. So as you can see on your screen, the picture on the left is a recent picture of Green Island, and the picture on your right is of a reddish egret. Uh, reddish egrets were thought to have been completely hunted off the Texas coast until there was one population discovered on Green Island for that for whatever reason had been overlooked by hunters. And so the first coastal warden um, set out to, tr to protect this population. And originally coastal wardens kind of backed like a game warden. They were um, oftentimes armed and it could be a very contentious position. Um, today our coastal warden program looks a lot different. It's pretty much synonymous with stewardship and we're doing a lot of education and vegetation planting and monitoring. And I'm happy to say that Green Island is still an island we manage today. It's at the very southern end of Texas coast near the Mexico border and now it hosts the largest population of reddish egrets in the Gulf of Mexico and each year has about 500 breeding pairs of this bird on the island. So this has been a great uh, recovery story for this bird and some of these other species in Texas and around the Gulf of Mexico. So next slide, please. And the next bird I wanted to share, I think also has a great story of resilience. Uh, this is a brown pelican. Um, after the, the hunting had ceased, the brown pelicans had an additional stressor. They were heavily impacted by DDT use. So DDT was uh, banned in 1972, but before that it had not been broadly used. And so most people have probably seen those pictures of DDT being sprayed on the beach or in neighborhoods or maybe even remember being sprayed with it when they were out and about. And so that um, at the time was thought to be a good way to control insects that didn't harm humans and other animals. And we now know had a serious impact on birds and their ability to hatch healthy young. So the brown pelican uh, declined and was listed as endangered in 1970. Um, luckily in 2009, it was removed from the endangered species list. Um, next slide, please. Um, and part of that recovery story was a man named Chester Smith who worked on the Mid-Texas coast as an Audubon Coastal Warden. So if you see on the map here where we are, we're in the Mid-Texas coast, we're in Matagorda Bay, and that white arrow is going to take you right to Chester Island. Next slide, please. And this is an aerial image of Chester Island. Um, it's named now named after Chester Smith in his honor. It, it, it's also called Sundown Island or commonly called Bird Island just because of the sheer amount of birds that use this island. Um, you can also see that it has vegetation and sandy beaches, which makes a lot of great habitat for different birds. When this island was first formed, it was built by the Army Corps of Engineers um, when they dredged a nearby ship channel and needed somewhere to put that sediment. So they created this island and it started off as um, just bare sand, but the birds still used it and they still like nesting there. So next slide, please. Um, and this is a picture of Chester Smith when he was featured in Audubon Magazine in 2010. 
And so when, um, when Chester became the Audubon Warden in 1986, Chester Island had less than 10 pairs of breeding brown pelicans and wasn't heavily vegetated. So Chester set out to um, ensure that brown pelicans had a place to nest on this island. So he planted vegetation, he built nesting platforms so that the birds had extra places to nest. He also organized cleanups, uh, debris removal, and developed a strong following of volunteers, many of those people who are still volunteering on the island today. And then he did a lot of education and outreach, both through signs on the island and in the community to inform people about why these birds were important and ways they could reduce their disturbance so that the birds could nest and, and have successful hatches. And through Chester's efforts, we now have um, 1,700 pairs of brown pelicans, or I'm sorry, 3,700 pairs of brown pelicans nesting on Chester Island. And he was uh, recently honored before his death in 2011. It's one of the reasons that brown pelicans were removed from the endangered species list in Texas. So next slide, please. Um, but Chester didn't do it alone. It was, a, it was a family effort. He had pulled in volunteers and he also developed relationships with a lot of partners, including the Army Corps of Engineers, who when the island started eroding, he was able to work with them to get more sediment to, um, to build out the island. And this picture here is a picture of Peggy and Tim Wilkinson. Peggy is uh, Chester's daughter and they worked with Chester and have since taken over the stewardship in the island. And Tim is now our coastal warden at Chester Island. And this picture here is taken from a drone flyover of Chester Island in 2017. And I wanted to share it with you because I think it illustrates how important stewardship is for birds and what an impact it can have on populations. Each dot on this map represents a breeding pair of birds. So that includes those 3,700 brown pelicans, but the total pairs in 2017 was about 18,000 pairs of breeding birds using this island. So that's roughly 36,000 individual birds who benefited um, from having Chester Island in, in the mid coast of Texas. And next slide, please. And the last picture I wanna share with you is a picture that Tim, Tim sent to me a few weeks ago. This picture shows the first brown pelican chicks of this season on Chester Island. They're a little bit hard to make out, but if you look at those orange arrows, they should be pointing you right to those baby pelicans. So thank you, next slide, and I will hand it over to Katie. Thank you, Alexis. Hi, everybody, this is Katie with Audubon, Louisiana, and I am going to introduce to you all the beach nesting birds that utilize the Gulf Coast. Next slide, please. The least tern is a tiny migratory seabird that is arriving now on the Gulf Coast to nest. They are colonial, which means that they nest in large groups and they are very vocal and they can be pretty chattery along the shorelines. You see these tiny little white birds in the air diving into the open ocean for fish. They prefer open beachfronts and barrier islands for nesting. Next slide, please. Like the least tern, the black skimmer is a colonial nester as well. They are seen annually along the Gulf Coast and they feed from the open water and prefer open beachfront and barrier islands across the Gulf. Next slide, please. Here are a few images of the life stages that you can see on the Gulf during the spring and summer. You can see the eggs and the young downy flightless chicks of least terns and black skimmers here. And they grow up to be juveniles and learn from their parents how to hunt for food. Next slide, please. In addition to the colonial nesters, we have solitary nesting species. This is the migratory Wilson's plover, a very charming charismatic species here uh, that we protect in Louisiana and in other Gulf states as well. They are super sneaky and secretive where they put their nests and they're often very chattery and vocal and they prefer vegetated dunes with adjacent marsh and exposed mudflats for foraging. And they are actually uh, a species that really love Louisiana because of the muddy beaches. So Louisiana is home to 31% of the breeding population in the US. Next slide, please. The snowy plover is a very cute little shorebird that also is solitary. 
And this means that they form a pair bond and defend a small territory. They're often more silent and secretive and they blend in really well to the sand, but they can become a little more vocal as they are raising chicks and defending chicks from threats. They prefer open sandy beaches with little vegetation, very similar to least terns and black skimmers. So wide open spaces for this species as well. Next slide, please. The snowy and Wilson's plovers, um, these are their life stages that you can see, just like the black skimmer and the least tern. So they lay their eggs in the sand. And then uh, unlike the least terns and the black skimmers, the plover chicks can actually get up within an hour or so after hatching and independently forage on their own and be protected by their parents. You can see uh, some images there of juveniles. They look like small adults as they uh, mature. Next slide, please. So one thing that all of these species have in common is that they're extremely well camouflaged. Their eggs and chick chicks blend into the sand, making them very vulnerable to a wide variety of threats along our Gulf Coast. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk to y'all about the threats to beach nesting birds and the suite of threats that they face here along the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide, please. If you've ever been to the Gulf Coast or any other beach, you know that it is a highly dynamic ecosystem. So they're constantly changing and they have um, a lot of, they experience a lot of coastal land loss and erosion of subsidence, sea level rise, all things we are combating with here along the Gulf Coast. And with the changing climate, we are seeing more frequent hurricanes and intensified storms. The Gulf Coast is also very attractive and a lot of people live directly on the beaches. And so we see a lot of coastal development, which in turn increases disturbances to these birds and also uh, creates loss of habitat for nesting and foraging for these beach nesting species. Next slide, please. The beach nesting birds have a host of natural predators such as ghost crabs, coyotes, snakes, raccoons, and other birds, such as crows and gulls. You can see some of the predators here. These predators will prey on eggs and chicks throughout the breeding season and can be found on open beach fronts. Next slide, please. In addition to predators, the birds are competing for space because as we all know, the Gulf of Mexico is quite beautiful and is a attracting place to go to vacation. And the birds are occupying the same space that we like to go and recreate. So you can see here a large black skimmer colony in Florida, utilizing the open beachfront for nesting and raising their young. And there are people in the background using the beach. Next slide, please. Some additional human related threats to these birds, beach driving and firework displays that, that occur on the beach can be fatal to nesting colonies. Nests can unintentionally be run over. Fireworks can startle adults from their nesting areas and scare the adults away from their nests and cause abandonment. Next slide, please. Additionally, for human-related threats, dogs that are running off-leash on beaches, as well as kites flying over nesting areas, can actually imitate natural predators like coyotes and gulls. And this can also cause death and adults to abandon their young and eggs. Next slide, please. In addition to the human-related threats, and natural predators, of course, there are natural disasters and weather events. These weather events are, are a natural phenomenon, such as hurricanes, storm surge, and flooding. And coastal restoration is one way we are restoring uh, our, our, the health of our ecosystems and building marsh and beach fronts to recover from the BP oil spill. And in Louisiana, coastal restoration is occurring uh, quite rapidly, and we have a lot of restored areas, a lot of restored beachfronts 
So um, in June 2017, Tropical Storm Cindy made landfall in Louisiana. And this is a picture of one of our restored beaches called Elmer's Island. And this is in Grand Isle, Louisiana. And you can see the aftermath after a storm. You see some of our uh, signs and posts are down. You can see the impact of the storm. Um, coastal restoration allows for us to protect our human communities to the north of the beach. And it allows us to also create habitat for birds and other wildlife. Next slide, please. So in Louisiana, we, we look at responses to beach renourishment projects. These beach renourishment projects cost millions of dollars and they're large scale. And we notice that after a large scale restoration project is completed, we see a huge spike in the number of nesting pairs using restored beaches. So this graph is showing the number of nesting lease turn pairs from 2016 and 2018 and how they are responding to these renourishment projects. And you can see the spike in the number of breeding pairs right after restoration has been completed. So essentially the beachfront is a wide open space and is attracting lots of lots of lease turns. Next slide, please. Audubon scientists monitor nests to understand how birds are doing. Not only are they being attracted to these coastal restoration areas, but they also nest on unrestored areas. And so here in Louisiana, we have been studying nest success on restored and unrestored beaches of lease turns. And you can see this is the lease turn nest success over a span of three seasons, the sample size of 1,075 nests monitored by Audubon scientists. And the key take home message with this graph is you can see in 2017 when we had many unnamed storms as well as tropical storm Cindy, we actually had higher nest success on the restored sites than we did on unrestored sites. You can see that arrow pointing to the higher value of daily nest success. So why are the birds more successful on a restored site during a stormy year? Next slide, please. Well, with beach renourishment projects comes elevational gains. And with that increase in elevation, we actually found that 33% of known least turn nests at Elmer's Island in Grand Isle survived Tropical Storm Cindy, whereas everywhere else across the Louisiana coast, we had 100% nest loss. So the birds are actually benefiting from these renourishment projects because they're able to combat the storm surge and flooding a lot more. And we're also finding over the span of several years that lease turns are readily selecting for these higher ground areas when offered. Next slide, please. In addition to coastal restoration, it's important to note that natu the natural weather events such as hurricanes can actually be beneficial to a species depending on its timing, of course. So in October of 2018, there was a category five hurricane that struck the Florida Panhandle, Hurricane Michael. And it scoured the vegetation and created this habitat that snowy plovers love. And it actually boosted their productivity the, the, the following season. You can see the numbers there are astronomical. Just within the hurricane impact area, we saw 68 fledglings in 2019, just in that area, that, that hurricane impact area where the beach was scoured, compared to just 12 fledglings that fledged from that area in 2018. So there are benefits to storms, just depending on the timing of when those storms hit the Gulf Coast. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Audubon is continuing to protect and restore the birds' habitats. And we are, under, we are seeing that there is a long-term need for monitoring and stewardship. And 10 years after the BP oil spill, we're still finding that Birds still need our help. We have a lot of, they have a lot of threats against them and the birds are uh, in need of our help. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Melinda who's going to explain Audubon's coastal stewardship work and how we help the birds overcome these threats. Thank you, Katie. My name is Melinda Averhart and I'm the stewardship manager for Audubon Mississippi. Next slide, please. 
So I have the pleasure of talking about Audubon's Coastal Bird Stewardship Program and what that looks like today. Let's just start off with a really simple explanation of what stewardship is. So stewardship is taking care of something that's entrusted to us. And in this case, that means coastal birds and their habitats. Next slide, please. Specifically, I'll be talking about uh, Audubon stewardship efforts across the Gulf Coast. When we head out to our favorite beaches every summer, uh, coastal birds are often the first thing that we hear and see when we arrive. Now these birds are sharing their nesting habitat with us during the busiest times of the year. Uh, coastal stewardship efforts can help reduce occurrences of human related disturbance as Katie just went through. This map shows all of Audubon's uh, coastal stewardship sites and monitoring sites across the Gulf Coast. As you can see, it takes a really large effort to help protect these birds. Next slide, please. So let's get into some of the strategies that Audubon uses for stewardship Gulf wide. First, let's talk about symbolic posting of nesting colonies. So the word symbolic is used because these postings don't necessarily keep beachgoers from entering a nesting colony. It's a suggestion that it would be best for humans and for the birds if everyone was to stay out of these posted sensitive areas. So symbolic posting can include uh, putting up ropes uh, and posts around a colony to protect active nests. And sometimes areas are even pre-posted when they know that the birds will nest in these areas year after year. We also hang a variety of signage, including educational and directional signs, as you can see in this image here. And then on occasion, we do use temporary signage outside of these posted areas to help increase buffer zones during really beach, uh, busy beach holidays. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide goes hand in hand with the posted colony. Typically, when you see a posted colony out on the beach, you'll see individuals like this with umbrellas and tents, uh, often spotting scopes and sometimes signage. They're referred to as stewards. So a steward is a sentinel for the birds. They help guard the birds at the nesting colonies. Uh, they have a variety of uh, tasks that they perform while they're out there including helping to educate the public and answer any questions about the birds. They also help to reduce human-related disturbance, as Katie described, such as uh, an off-leash dog running through a colony or if someone is flying a kite too close to the colony. They also do on-site advocacy, which can be as simple as just having a presence out on the beach. Um, when we have stewards out on the beach, it's a statement to the community that these areas are really important for the states. And they can be important for a variety of reasons, but one of those would be to help increase nature-based tourism along the Gulf Coast. Our stewards actively participate in science. They help do bird counts. They collect disturbance data. And they also uh, collect data on their public interactions. Next slide, please. One of the really fun aspects of stewardship is, is education. And education is often centered around uh, formal lesson plans that are developed and delivered uh, and talk about beach nesting birds and their life histories. So these lesson plans do uh, typically result in um, different products such as these signs that you can see on the left hand side here. So those signs were actually created by students and they're hung every summer out at the beach nesting bird colonies. Education can be at public schools, at private schools. It can encompass all age groups from kindergarten up into uh, colleges. We also educate at public libraries, um, very often nature centers, and um, next slide, please. So outreach is sort of one of the last um, key things that we do. Outreach can be really important because it helps to reach people who may not have been um, captured during those other stewardship techniques that I talked about. 
The great thing about outreach is that it's mobile and that it can be done at a variety of outlets and different venues. So some of the things that you'll see Autobahn doing include hosting and attending various festivals and farmers markets. We often host uh, training events for condo and homeowners associations to help uh, educate about what's going on on the beaches and to recruit uh, active stewards. We do a lot of TV and radio segments during breeding season to help educate the public and let them know what's going on out on the beaches. We also send newsletters to our communities on the coast and just to keep them informed about Audubon's achievements and what's going on in the community. And then just like this webinar now, we do host a variety of webinars to help educate people that are interested in learning more about beach nesting birds. Next slide, please. So now that I've described kind of the nuts and bolts of Audubon's stewardship work, I just want to talk a little bit about what we do here in Mississippi during the 4th of July. Next slide, please. So I just want to talk a little bit about Mississippi's habitat because it is very unique. All of our beaches here on the coast are man-made. They were constructed in 1952. And currently we host about 2,500 pairs of breeding lease terns every summer. Now I wanted to include this image um, that shows you an actual lease tern colony in Biloxi. All of those pink flags are marking individual lease tern nests. Now this was during a time when the Mississippi Coast Audubon Society was doing all of the monitoring and stewardship for the birds. I just wanted to show you how dense our colonies can be. So not only do we have very dense colonies, but we can typically have between 10 to 20 nesting colonies per summer. So as you can imagine, it can be very difficult to protect 10 to 20 different areas simultaneously on the 4th of July. Next slide, please. As I said, our beaches are man-made. So that being said, uh, they are heavily managed, as you can see in this image here. They are typically raked fairly frequently, which is to control erosion, also to help control vegetation, and to collect marine debris and litter. Our beaches are also extensively used in the summertime for a variety of recreation. There are areas of low traffic and high traffic. Uh, our beaches are backed up by a seawall uh, that runs along Highway 90. So there are many parking bays along the coast and certainly that human uh, interaction can uh, affect the productivity of these colonies. So listed above here are uh, several of our partners that we actively work with that help make our stewardship efforts a success. Next slide, please. So one of the unique things about the 4th of July in Mississippi is that local ordinances state that people cannot light fireworks off at their residences. However, they can light fireworks off at the beaches. So you can see in this image, there are quite a few people uh, gathered on the left-hand side along the seawall. This was actually taken at a colony in Gulfport last year, and uh, I was sitting right along our black skimmer colony. So as you can imagine, uh, these fireworks create quite a bit of noise and uh, also quite a bit of flashing light, which can be uh, very distressing for these birds do during a really important uh, part of their life cycle as they're raising their chicks. Next slide, please. So we've done a couple really unique things that we're very proud of here. And one of the things that we tried last year was to partner with local fireworks stands and businesses. So uh, they really embraced us and they actually hung these posters in their windows, as you can see on the right hand side. They uh, included flyers listing locations of active nesting colonies and kind of the do's and don'ts of, of what to do on the beaches during this holiday. Um, so it turned out to be quite a success. Next slide, please. And then the other thing that we've done in Mississippi for the last several years that's uh, turned out to be really wonderful is we hire the Harrison County Sheriff's Department. So stewards are not law enforcement. We are simply there to help educate the public 
Um, and you can imagine with this huge influx of people coming in from you know, the local areas as well as bordering states for the holiday, uh, the sheriffs have been very instrumental in protecting these birds. We station one sheriff at each of our nesting colonies and they sort of help us with crowd control and kind of just keeping things from getting too rowdy. And what that results in is the next slide, please. Is this adorable least turn and this least turn parent. And these efforts have really been very fruitful in Mississippi and they've allowed the birds to flourish. As they say, it takes a village and it's really uh, been very heartwarming and we're very grateful to have such good partnerships with our community and other local agencies. So I'm going to turn it over to Holly Short with Audubon, Florida, and she's going to talk about some of their efforts that they make in Florida. Holly, you might be on mute, we can't hear you. I was really getting into it too, I'm so sorry. Um, Hi everybody, I'm Holly and as Melinda said, I'm with Audubon Florida. Um, so right now I just wanted to get into a special kind of stewardship that we do here in Florida and in some of our other Gulf states off the beaches. So we see coastal birds finding and using alternative nesting habitats on rooftops instead of on our beaches. So as you can see in this photo, um, there's a large gravel rooftop and this gravel rooftop can mimic open sandy beaches that are required by many um, of our coastal species to nest and to raise their young. So this picture in particular shows a least turn colony using a gravel rooftop at a local grocery store. So each of those small dots that you see is a least turn incubating eggs or sitting on small chicks. Um, so it's great that some of these species are finding these alternative habitats um, where, where they're losing um, important nesting habitat on our beaches, um, but rooftop nesters experience their own sets of challenges. Next slide. So in Florida, we find both colonial and solitary nesting species using rooftops, including least terns and American oyster catchers. And in this photo, we have a pair of oyster catchers and their chick um, right next to a very large AC unit uh, right on a gravel rooftop. Next slide, please. So to give you a better idea of how important these alternative habitats are becoming um, because of the loss of natural habitat, um, check out how many of Florida's least term population are using rooftops. 58% of our nesting population here in Florida. And we're also seeing about 3% of American oyster catchers um, in Florida using rooftops to breed instead of their natural beach habitats. Next slide. So why are they moving to rooftops? What is so great about these rooftops? Um, well, the loose gravel mimics the open and spacious sandy and shelly beaches that many of these species prefer. Uh, there are also rarely any people around unless um, there is rooftop or air conditioning maintenance that needs to be done. So instead of our beaches where we have a lot of people coming to visit, a lot of people living on our beaches now, um, rooftops just do not have as many people as their native habitats do. Next slide. So rooftop nesters experience very unique and sometimes even more difficult challenges than they would on beaches. Rooftops, they get incredibly hot. Um, so without the natural shade from vegetation or even a shoreline with a nice cool breeze, um, chicks have to use the AC units or even other structures to find shade and find a cool spot. So sometimes we find um, chicks of all ages huddled under the, uh, the small um, bit of shade so they can cool off. And then there are also new predators such as owls, hawks, 
rats, mice, and even feral cats that are living on many of these uh, properties. And of course, the biggest challenge are chicks falling over the edge of the rooftop, and they sometimes are found wandering around in parking lots. Next slide. But don't worry, uh, we have developed a great program specific to monitoring rooftops using Audubon staff and plenty of volunteers. Through monitoring, we can conduct counts from the ground and volunteers become chick checkers for fallen chicks. And sometimes we are able to install fencing, like in the photo on the left, uh, along the edges of these rooftops to prevent the chicks from falling. We also provide education to building owners, managers, and communities about rooftop nesting. And once in a while, we even provide a cleaning service. Um, least turn colonies in particular can create a mess by pooing everywhere. So volunteers offer a hand by cleaning cars or scrubbing sidewalks. Um, the photo at the bottom of the slide is a photo of volunteers before they started cleaning and that's why they're smiling. Um, but honestly, we could not do any of these programs and we could not do the stewardship without the amazing volunteers like we have pictured. Next slide. Okay, so I actually think I saw a question coming in about what to do um, when the beaches open back up. What, what can we do to help? So I'm going to provide some of those tips. Um, similarly to the rest of the Gulf um, Beach residents, like Rachel mentioned earlier, Audubon Florida staff are off the beaches and we're following local ordinances and stay at home orders. So this means that much of coastal bird nesting is being left unmonitored. Um, this also means that there are probably nests out on the beach right now. And unfortunately, symbolic fencing is not being installed to mark off and protect nests. And with no people, birds may even be finding new sites to nest where they normally may not be found. And this is where Audubon really needs your help when the beaches do reopen. Next slide. So the best thing to do is when we are able to get back out, out on the beach, give the birds space. Um, we are recommending that at least 150 feet um, is safe enough, but it can also vary by species and more space may need to be required. Um, so walk around resting individuals and flocks just to make sure that any potential nest that is present is safe. Um, and if you're not sure whether or not you're too close, watch for behavioral clues through calls and body language and ask yourself, okay, what is this bird telling me? Next slide. So these behavioral clues include posture, um, such as the black skimmer uh, in the top right picture, the way this bird is sitting in the sand, um, it is an incubation posture, which means it's sitting on eggs. Um, birds can also, also mob you, or as I like to say, dive bomb you. Um, broken wing displays like the Wilson's plover in the bottom photo are a telling sign of being too close to eggs or even chicks. Of course, listen for alarm calls and watch for any other sort of agitated or distressed behaviors. Next slide. When you're returning to beaches where pets are allowed, um, of course, make sure you know which beaches those are. Um, be sure that your pets are leashed and kept away from resting birds. Remember, not, nests may not be posted um, due to the lack of Audubon staff out on the beaches right now. Um, we've already learned from Katie that dogs can be seen as predators and cause birds to abandon their nests if they're too close. So remember, um, whether you're walking the beach alone or with a pet, the best thing to do when returning to the beaches is just to give birds space. Next slide. You're giving birds space, yet you still find a nest. Um, what do you do? So we're asking that you report it if you do find a nest or a nesting colony. Um, Audubon staff or partners will be able to install symbolic fencing. 
And these emails uh, right here are the best ways to reach Audubon staff. And um, we will, of course, be sending these out um, along with the recording. So I am going to hand it back to Rachel um, as we move on to the next slide. Thank you, Holly. Yes, like Holly said, this webinar is being recorded. Everyone who registered for the webinar will get a link to the recording afterwards in their email. And the recording will also live on National Audubon Society's Facebook for everyone who is watching on Facebook Live. Um, so no need to scribble these emails down here. There's always a, a place you can go back and refer to them. I'll also put up this next slide with information on how to learn more about uh, Audubon's work in the four Gulf states uh, where we have state offices, as well as the email addresses for each of our speakers. And now we'll start taking questions uh, for each of our speakers. So there's been some questions rolling in on the chat. Please feel free to, if you haven't already, type in your questions in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them as time allows, but if we miss them, we apologize in advance. Um, so let's see, there was a good question here. Holly, maybe you can take this. Um, it's especially about red tide. Is that a big disturbance in Florida? Yes, um, it definitely can be, especially uh, further southwest Florida. Um, red tide has, I apologize. Um, red tide has been a large issue in the past and can cause birds of multiple species to become ill um, and potentially die. Um, so red tide has a huge impact on both nesting and migratory species in the Gulf Coast. Thank you. Um, Alexis, here's a good question specifically for Texas. And I should also mention we're of course not suggesting to anyone that if you are under a stay at home order and your beaches are closed where you are, please obey those orders. Audubon is obeying those orders. We take them very seriously. Um, but Holly's tips I think are really helpful um, because we're all looking forward to that day when we can get back out to the beach. Uh, but this question, Alexis, is especially about Green Island and Chester Island. Are they open for birding? Not during lockdown, of course, but just during no normal times? Are those places that people can access? Well, it, it's different for each island. So both are, you know, within a boat ride from the coast, but when the birds are there nesting, because disturbance can have such an impact on the birds, we ask that people stay at least 150 yards away. And there's plenty of signs to show you when um, breeding season is happening and ongoing. And so you can definitely go out and get near the islands, but we ask that you don't get on the islands, but they aren't, you know, um, private islands, they're state owned that we lease from the state to manage. Um, we do have an active volunteer group in Texas called the Texas Estuarine Resource Network, and they do a lot of volunteer monitoring for us. And so they'll go out to the islands and either by boat do surveys or when the birds aren't there can go on the islands and do bird counts. And so if you're interested in volunteering with that group, you know, definitely shoot me an email and we can, we can talk about when the right time to do that is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here's another good one. Um, since a lot of people aren't at the beaches anymore, um, because a lot of us are staying home to prevent the spread of coronavirus, is that better for the birds? Melinda, would you want to take that? Sure. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, in all reality, it probably is better for the birds. I mean, you know, the, a lot of these disturbance issues are related to humans. In an ideal world, if, if everybody knew what was happening with the birds and understood uh, the implications of disturbance, maybe my answer would be a little bit different. But I think that, you know, it's really more about finding a balance and coexisting and sharing the shores and, and being able to enjoy recreation and other activities along with the birds. So it, yes, it, it may be um, an unintended side effect, but you know, I, I still, you know, it, it's obviously it's not a great thing.
Let's see, Katie, there's a specific question about Louisiana here. Do we know why lease term breeding success decreased in the second year after beach renourishment? Hi, yes, we do. Um, can you repeat the question just so that everybody can hear it again? Yeah, why did the lease term breeding success decrease in the second year after beach renourishment in Louisiana? Sure, yes. So um, what we're finding is that these restoration projects attract lease terns and birds that really like those wide open spaces. And on stormy years, they're benefiting from the elevation. But on years where they're drier and we don't have um, the storms keeping the predators off the beach, the, the predators um, are taking, taking um, nests and actually decreasing the nest success. So there's an um, there's not a, a proper balance. Uh, there's not predator management going on, not enough predator management going on uh, to keep the balances in check so that birds are not being um, decimated by predators on a year that's not as impacted by storms. Interesting, thank you. There's a couple questions on how birds are doing 10 years after the oil spill. Uh, and if we have stats on, on what happened, I can take that really quickly. Um, I know that um, the BP oil spill, of course, oiled over a thousand miles of shoreline on the Gulf Coast. The number of oiled birds is really tricky to estimate um, just because of how big the Gulf is, how little data we had on our bird populations prior to the oil spill. And it's very possible that a lot of the birds who, who died or, or were injured by the oil spill died, you know, out of sight in the marsh or way out in the open ocean. So the estimates range pretty wildly from um, 100,000 birds killed by the BP oil spill to uh, around 1 million. And what that really highlighted for us is the need for more data. Um, and that's why this Coastal Stewardship Program is so important. The more data we have on um, just how big our bird populations on the Gulf Coast are, the better prepared we can be for disasters like this, and the more information we have at hand to know how to help, help them recover. Um, we have a good question um, from Venice, Florida. How can we find out how to volunteer for some of these initiatives? And then we have another question similar to that. If you can't volunteer, you can't donate money, how can you help contribute to this effort? Absolutely. And I'll just go ahead and take it since it's from Venice. Um, so I'll start with that first question. Um, for anybody, anybody um, that is interested in becoming a bird steward in any of our states, um, please reach out to us or you can reach out to the general email. Um, so for Florida, you could reach out to either me and I can send you to the right person um, or you can reach out to Audubon's conservation email. Uh, I believe it's flconservation at audubon.org. Um, I do have to say we have we have somewhere near you. Um, so um, the other question, what can you do to help um, if you don't have the time to volunteer or are, un are unable to donate? Um, spread the word. Um, anytime you find the opportunity to educate a friend or a family member, do so. Um, if you are crafty and are able to assist with making um, maybe a flyer, you know, there, there are so many other ways to help other than being on the beach or donating, um, donating money. So um, you can always get in touch with that specific person to, to kind of feel out what, what you're able to do for us. So thank you for your offer. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll also mention because a lot of our work is online while we're all stuck inside. Um, if you registered for this webinar and you agreed to be added to the Audubon email list, you'll get more opportunities for, um, you'll, you'll hear more opportunities about how you can be a good advocate for birds online. Um, and I would also say um, follow along our social media because that's also the best way to get information on, on our work and what birds need. 
Uh, here's an interesting question. How do, you, how do we approach people with service dogs who might be getting too close to nesting colonies? Has anyone experienced that? I can take that, Rachel. Um, and it, it probably the answer to this would differ state to state. Um, you know, really it would be treated the same as, as any dog and we would just ask that um, you walk around the colony or keep the distance great enough so that the birds are not exhibiting those behaviors that Holly talked about earlier, such as, you know, flushing and mobbing. I mean, certainly we can all coexist and it's really just a matter of, of giving them space. Awesome, thank you. We have another question about predators on nesting beaches. Does it make sense to remove predators on these nesting beaches, like coyotes or raccoons? I can take that. Um, yeah, so predators, of course, are, you know, they're, these predators are natural. And so um, it's really the management of predators. It's not wiping them out because they are part of the natural ecosystem but managing so that there aren't so many that it's uh, not a balance, There's, it's an unbalanced amount. So the unbalanced populations can really impact the birds. And so it's just finding those balances of proper management and that varies state to state. Melinda, we have a question here about providing shade for birds. Um, I know that's something that Audubon Mississippi does. Um, and then Holly, this is also specifically about rooftops. Does it make sense to plant bushes on rooftops? Do you, um, I'm gonna let Holly answer that because they have considerably more uh, rooftop nests. Of so I'm sorry, was the first question also about shade on rooftops? Or? Yeah, providing, pro providing natural shade for birds on rooftops by planting bushes. So um, I have, we have not gone to that particularly about, you know, putting um, bushes or anything like that on rooftops. Um, however, uh, on rooftops that have minimal to no shade, um, there are instances where we are able to put up what, what we refer to as a chick shelter. Um, so it's usually sh um, sh the wooden shipping pallets. Um, those are just high enough up off the ground for small chicks to get under. Um, and sometimes we even have had volunteers create um, chick shelters that accommodate larger chicks, such as black skimmers or um, oyster catchers. So we have implemented some shade techniques up there, but we have not explored the planting vegetation. Thank you. Alexis, we have a question about Galveston. Is there any coastal nesting there? There is, yes, there's a lot of coastal nesting in Galveston, um, both on the islands and on the beaches. And so uh, we work with, definitely work with partners in Galveston Bay. It's a huge area, specifically Houston Audubon um, and North Deer and South Deer Island have a lot of nesting. And then there's a lot of small islands in Galveston Bay as, way, as well with birds. Awesome. Mm -hmm. This is a good question that probably goes back to Katie's section about threats. Um, it says sea level rise is happening all over the world right now. How do you think it may impact nesting shorebirds in the future? And how quickly do you think these shorebirds can adjust? Does anyone want to take that one? I know it's hard. I'll, I'll take a brief stab at it. I think uh, Katie really highlighted um, with the restoration projects um, in Louisiana, how combating sea level rise um, can be tackled, if you will, 
I think um, all across the Gulf Coast, we're seeing a lot of restoration projects where um, islands are being created out of dredge material or elevations are being increased um, also from keeping shipping channels open with dredge material. I mean, ideally, it would be better to address the problem and slow down sea level rise instead of trying to scramble and you know keep uh, building land back up. So I think there's a there's a fine balance there of of using some of these techniques that we have to create islands and, and incre increase elevations, but also it's really more about fixing the problem. Yeah, that's a great point. I also want to highlight, Katie touched on this a little bit, but if you've been to the Gulf Coast, if you live on the Gulf Coast, you know that we don't have a ton of elevation here. So when we're talking about adding elevation to these nesting beaches, we are literally talking about like inches to maybe a foot or a few feet. I mean, it's really just that much sand that can mean a completely successful nesting season for these birds. Or, or a complete wipeout if we have a bad hurricane. Okay, we are nearing the top of the hour. Let's see if there are any more questions here at the bottom that I wasn't able to get to. Ooh, here's one about migration. We know the birds migrate for example, least terns migrate to South America. Do we know about the birding support activities in those other countries? That's a good question. Does anyone, does any of our speakers have any examples of working with other countries to try to track these migrating birds throughout the hemisphere? Hey, Rachel, I can, I, I can add a little bit to that. I don't know too much about what's happening in South America, but one example we have from Texas, since we do share a border with Mexico, uh, there's a Rio Grande Gulf uh, Joint Venture, which is a bunch of nonprofits and agencies working together for bird conservation. And we do participate in the Rio Grande joint venture to work with our partners in Mexico on, on bird conservation. So that's one example, but I don't know any specifics, you know, but that's the, that's the best example I could share for now. I can also add, I know a lot of our um, stewardship staff uh, will also spend a little time banding the birds that we steward. And those, ba those bands allow us to track the birds' movement throughout the hemisphere. There's a huge network, a really active network of people who will go out and cite with their binoculars those bands and report them online. If you go to um, our website, which I dropped into the chat, audubon.org slash gulf, we have a great blog there from our Florida staff about the importance of bird banding and how that can kind of piece together the puzzle of where these birds go when they leave our beaches. Rachel, I wanted to just add to that. Um, here in Louisiana, we banned Wilson's plover adults and our banded population migrates to Central America. And we've actually had some recited birds in Nicaragua and Costa Rica. So we do have some of those little tidbits of information coming to us and um, it's really cool to be able to use banding as a tool to start forming those relationships interna internationally. Awesome. Thank you for that question. Um, okay, we'll take one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Holly, this seems like a good one for you. What happens to chicks if they fall off the rooftops? Do they bounce? <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, so most of the chicks that fall, that do end up falling off, um, a lot of the rooftops are a bit shorter. They're not coming from tall sky-rise condos or, or anything like that, maybe two stories max. 
um, for a lot of our least turns at least. So in speaking about the least turn chicks that fall off where we really have our chick checking programs, um, when they fall off, they're very lightweight. I mean, super lightweight. Um, so most of the time they do survive the fall over um, or they'll tumble down a gutter and they'll be um, fine. The issue is when they get to the ground. Um, they're usually in parking lots. Um, people aren't looking out for them. There could be um, predators such as feral cats that are hanging around. So those, those are the big issues. Um, but that's when we have our chick checking program in place for those unprotected rooftops. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have volunteers go out. They will chick check, um, look for these fallen chicks, and they will put them back up onto the rooftop. And we know that there is success with these chicks um, getting back together with their parents and, and being raised to fully fledging. Um, so we put them back up onto the roof, not by accessing the roof, because that would cause a huge disturbance, but by using a um, tool that we call a chickaboom, um, developed by some local Audubon chapters. Um, so it's just a big pole. We roll it up the side and um, essentially dump the little chicks out. And we have had a banding program in place with a partner. And we know from this banding program that these small chicks do survive and they do make it. Um, they do make it. So that's awesome. That must be that long pole that was in your slide. It was. It's a very scientific. <laughs> <tool>. <laughs> Good. Well, bouncy chicks. Let's end on a high note. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us. Like I said, uh, if you registered for the webinar, you'll get an email with uh, all of these links, as well as the recording. Um, and you can also find the recording on National Audubon Society's Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you all have a great day. <laughs>